So Steffi is going to play one game of tennis and one game of chess. The probability that she will win the game of tennis is 0 0.6. So we can write here a little note. Probability that she will win tennis is 0 0.6. So this means that the property that she does not win tennis, so instead of saying lose, it's better to say not win because maybe drawing is involved. And that's going to be 0 0.4, okay? And the reason behind this is because all properties must sum up to 1. Now the next one tells us the property that she will win both games is 0 0.42. So it's what this means is that the property that she will win tennis and also win at chess is 0 0.42. So what this also means, and we can separate this probability, is saying that the probability that she wins tennis the first round, then she wins chess is 0 0.42, and winning tennis is going to be, well, we already know what that is, is 0 0.6 times winning at chess is 0 0.42, and then just rearranging to find the property that she wins chess. So you could just divide these two, and if you divide it, you'll find that probability of winning chess is actually... 0 0.7 or 70. Okay, so that's good. And what that also means, guys, the property that she does not win chess is going to be 0 0.30 or 0 0.3. So I feel like we got everything now. Now the question wants us to work out the property that she will not win either game. Well, we have all the probabilities. The property that she will not win tennis is 0 0.4 and the property that she will not win chess is 0 0.3. So if we times both 0 0.4 with 0 0.3, the answer should be 0 0.12 or 0 0.12. And we're done. Okay, question 17. So the function f is such that fx equals x minus 4 all squared. Okay, so this is defined by fx. And they want us to find f1. In other words, replace the x value of 1. Well, if you just do that, f1 is just literally going to be 1 minus 4 squared. And if you put this in a calculator, you just get a straight answer of 9. So that's it. Now B, state the range of the function f. So to find the range, they essentially want us to see how the graph looks like and see what values of y it takes. So to plot this function, I'll just plot it like this. You got your x and you got y axes. We know for sure that because the function is x minus 4 squared, this means it hits at x equals 4 twice. So if it hits at some curve twice it means it bounces so suppose x equals 4 is here this is going to be a quadratic bouncing of it like that so as you can see it hits on the axes and the lowest value on the y axis is 0 and the highest is well it's infinity so we say that the range of f so the range of f x is greater than equal than 0 and that's it because it starts from 0 and it goes all the way up and lastly for the next question it says that the function g is such that gx equals 4 over x plus 3. Work out fg2. Okay, what this means is that you have a function g and it goes inside f. So that's how it works. The second layer goes inside the first. Now what they're trying to tell us is that you should find g2 first. Well, g2 it just means replace the x with 2. So f over 2 plus 3 is actually 4 fifths which is 0 0.8 if you like. And now you're going to put this 0 0.8 into fx. So we can say, right, f 0 0.8 is going to be 0 0.8 minus 4 all squared. And this is going to give us a nice result of 10.24. And that's functions done for you. So the diagram shows the graph of y equals fx for x between minus 4 and 12. All right, so this looks like a cubic graph, and they got a point P over there. Now, the point P on the curve has X coordinate 2. So it has an X coordinate 2 and actually a Y coordinate of, and if we zoom in carefully, we can see that 3 is up here, and everything's going up in point 2. So this should hit over here at 2.4. So the coordinate here is just 2 and 2.4. Now, they want us to use the graph to find an estimate for the gradient of the curve at P. Okay, so when they ask you to find a gradient at a certain point, you literally need to get a ruler and try and draw a straight line which touches P at one point. So something like, well, not like that. But I've actually previously done it, and it looks a bit like um, this. So this is kind of what they want. So you get a ruler and you draw a straight line like that. And well, to calculate the gradient, you simply just pick two points. And what I chose is the one at P, which we said was 2 and 2.4. 
and you'll probably realize that you should get y intercept of roughly 3.6. Now you can use this as a coordinate because if you, if you know the y intercept, then you know the coordinate for that would be 0, 3.6. So you can say the other coordinate would be 0 and 3.6. And well, guys, the gradient is just literally the change in y over change in x. So m equals change in y over change in x. That's essentially the difference between the corners. So over here, the change in y is just basically 3.6 minus 2.4 over 0 take away 2. If you put this in the calculator carefully, guys, you should get an answer of minus 3 over 5 or minus 0.6. And now the second part actually follows on directly from the first part. It says, hence, find an equation of the tangent to the curve at P. Give your answer in the form Y equals MX plus C. Well, the tangent is just literally the equation of this straight line. And the, we know that the general form of an equation is always Y equals MX plus C. We know what M is. M was just minus 0 0.6. We know what C is. C is the Y intercept, which is 3.6. So because you know what M is and you know what C is, then we can say that the equation is just simply y equals minus 0 0.6x plus a y-intercept of 3.6. Now, in the mask scheme, and I haven't got the mask scheme yet, guys, it could be a bit different. Maybe they got 0 0.5 or 0 0.7. So this is just an estimate, yeah? And usually with estimates, it could be a range of answers because it depends how, like how you draw your line. But it shouldn't be too far off these values. And finally, guys, it says here that the equation fx equals k. And by the way, fx equals k means that you hit um, fx with a constant. So let's say k could be, I don't know, uh, fx equals 2. This is the same as saying y equals 2. So this is just a straight line that hits the y-axis. So something like, like this, a straight line. Now, what they're trying to say here, and let's just read the question. It says that this equation has exactly two different solutions. Use the graph to find two possible values of k. Now, two different solutions literally implies is that it cuts through um, two different uh, parts of the curve. Well, if I just drew over here for a second, just in, as an example, you'll see it cuts at three points, so it can't be in the middle. Because you'll realize that almost everywhere it's three points. Now, when they say two points, the only possibility is if there's a turning point. Well, we can see that there's a turning point here. And if you drew a straight line there, you'll notice that it hits exactly once there, and it will hit here as well. So in fact, one of the possible lines for y would be y equals, and you can see that it hits at 3. Yeah? So this is at y equals 3. And you'll notice that the other possibility is at the other side, the other turning point, which is from here. So if you draw another straight line here that cuts across, it'll go all the way across, and it hits, well, at y equals minus 1. So these are your two solutions. And that's it, guys. And you can say k is going to be well, 3 or minus 1. And that's it. All right, question 19. Okay, so they give us a histogram now. And it tells us that this histogram gives information about the heights of all year 11 students at school. All right, so you got your height between 140 to 190, and you got frequency density on the y-axis. And the area of each block would be the number of pupils or the frequency. Now, there are 160 students in year 11 with a height between 155 and 170. So that tells us that, well, 155 should be this margin here, and 170 is here. So essentially, the area of these two blocks, this one and that one, has a total area of 160. Okay? Now, work out the total number of students in year 11 at the school. Alright, so an easy way to do this, guys, and since we've got some information already, is to kind of try and figure out what a height would be, yeah? Because the main idea is to basically, essentially work out the area of these blocks, equate it to 160, and then find what the height could be. So an easy way to do this, I'll say, let's just count in ones, yeah? So for every major line like here, this would be one, two, so I'll put this as one, two, three, four. And just to make it easy, just think of this as four x, three x, two x, and and just x, yeah? Now, if you work out the area of this block, you'll realize that you've got a base of, well, the difference is 5, and a height of 4x. And, well, 5 times 4x will just give us 20x. So that's the area of this block. For the second block, or this block here, the width is 10, and the height is 2x. So it be 10 times 2x is also 20x. So that means the total area of this block and that block, which is 40x, 
is also equal to 160 students. That means if you just if you do the quick math and divide by 40, you realize that x is just going to be 4. So that means that the value for every single major frequency density is 4. So I could just now update this. So just cross out this x. This is 4. This is 8. This is 12. And this is 16. And guys, like for the rest of this problem, you just basically now just work out the area of the rest of the blocks. So for example, this block over here has a width from 170 to 185. So that's a width of 15. So you've got 15 times a height of, well, what's that? That's between 4 and 6. 4 and 8, so that's a height of 6. So in your calculator, you just write, okay, 15 times 6. Put that in your calculator and you get an actual area of 90. For the next block, it's 5 times, oh, uh, that's annoying. So this, width, this height is actually a bit different. We know that the major line here, which is 2, and I think every single line is going up in 0.4. So in fact, the height is 2.4. So in your calculator, this area would be 5 times 2.4. And what 5 times 2.4 is just basically 12. Now for the last block, and that's the first one, the width is what, between 140 to 155, which is 15. So the width is 15, so 15 times. And the height is now from here up to this line. Uh, to check carefully, we know here is 6. It's going up in 0.4, so that's 6.4, 6.8, 7.2. So 15 times 7.2. If you do that, you should get a result of 108. And yeah, guys, now all you do is literally just um, add them up, yeah. So we know that these two blocks are 20x. X is 4, meaning these two blocks are 20 times 4, which is 80 and 80. And so adding all these results, 108 plus 12, plus the two AEs and plus the 90, you should get a total number of students of 370 year 11s at the school. All right, number 20. So the diagram shows a frostum of a cone and a sphere. Now the frostum is made by removing a small cone from a large cone and the cones are similar. Okay, so this is very important to note. When they tell you two things are similar, all it implies is that the small cone which is taken off from the big cone are just proportionally different. So we can see that the height of the small cone is actually h, but the height of the big cone is just two times bigger, 2h. So what that tells us guys, is that if these two have a scale factor of two times in difference, that means if the radius for the big cone is r, that means for the smaller cone it will be half the size. So in fact, the radius of the small cone is actually half of r, which is r over two. Now this could be helpful for solving the rest of the problem. Now, we're given some facts, the height of the small cone is h, large cone is 2h, and so and so. We also know that the radius of the big sphere is r. And finally, given that the volume of the frostum is equal to the volume of the sphere, so the frostum is basically what happens when you remove a small cone from a big cone, we, they want us to find an expression for r in terms of h. Okay, so let's make some notes. They tell us that the volume of the frostum is actually equal to the volume of the sphere over here. So to work out the volume of a frostum is literally the difference between the volume of a small cone and the volume of a big cone. And the formula looks like this. So volume for cone is just basically one third of pi um, r squared times the uh, height. I'm going to use capital letters so we don't mix up the radiuses and the heights. And as for the volume for sphere, it's just literally four thirds pi r cubed. Okay. So let's deal with the cone first, yeah? So we know... That the small cone has a radius of r over 2 and a height of h and a big cone has a radius of r and a height of 2h so let's do that yeah so we can say okay the volume for, of a frustum is simply the volume of a big cone minus the volume of the small cone so what this means guys is that the volume of the big cone is one third pi r squared and we know the height was 2h minus and the volume of the small cone is a third pi Instead of r squared, the radius is actually r over 2, so it would be bracket r over 2 squared, and the height is just h. So simplifying this fully, guys, we can just expand the brackets, so 2 times a third is just going to be 2 thirds pi r squared h. And now what I would do here, guys, is that I would actually square the r and get r squared, and square the 2, you get 4, so it would be r squared over 4. And in your calculator, you can write... 3 times 4, which is 12. So it becomes 
1 over 12 pi r squared h. And yeah, and here we can see that there's like terms, yeah? They all have pi r squared h. So in your calculator, just write 2 thirds minus 12, and you should get 7 over 12 pi r squared h. And that's it, guys. That's literally your volume for frustum. And well, the volume sphere is just the formula itself. So technically, the volume sphere is just 4 thirds pi r cubed. And now, according to the question, they told us that both of them are equal, right? So now we just equate this to the sphere. So we say, all right, 7 over 12 pi r squared h must equal 4 thirds of pi r cubed. And now we just go ahead and cancel what we can. So what we'll do, guys, they both have a pi, so cancel that out. They both have at least two powers of r, so r squared goes, and this power 3 goes, so you're left with r to power 1. And now the equation reduces to 7 over 12 h equals 4 thirds r. And now at this stage, they told us that they want to find the expression for r in terms of h. In other words, make r the subject. So finally, guys, I will just divide 4 thirds across. So in your calculator, it will look a bit like this. You can just write r equals, it will just be 7 twelfths over 4 thirds. And then just stick a h there. And when you put this kind of weird looking fraction in the calculator, it should reduce nicely to 7 over 16 h. And yeah, and that's it guys, this should be your result. I just want to thank you guys for coming to this end of my channel and if you've enjoyed the content so far just go onto my channel page hit the subscribe button and hit the bell for more notifications and if you want you can do personalize or all and that way you won't miss any future maths or educational videos anyway guys thank you for watching and see you next time ciao